Welcome to A Professor's Life, your weekly podcast about all things academia. I'm Chris. With me tonight is Stephen. Hello. And Robert. Hello. And if you like what you hear tonight, I will invite you to leave us a positive review on iTunes or on uh, YouTube. Yes, the YouTube. And, uh, you know, let us know what you like, what you don't like, but be kind. And also maybe rate show recommendations if you'd like us to talk about something specific academia related of course so you're just kicking so, that off this time so we don't forget like we usually well do. you know i was listening to like real podcasts the other day and i noticed that real podcasts actually do start with that sometimes they'll ask for the you know click like or subscribe which i forgot to put that part in so please click like or subscribe <laughs> all right or something like yeah or something or whatever whatever the buttons are below whatever you're watching or listening to uh just click on a bunch of them get us up <laughs> all of them <laughs> just click all of them i'm sure something good will happen and uh you can, things yes <laughs> enjoy the show just don't click the button that says unsubscribe we'd prefer you to not click that one Unless you click subscribe again right away. Well, yeah, then yes. And then you can, of course, keep doing that as much as you like. But make sure the final state is subscribe. <laughs> Good. All Very right. Binary. Yes. <laughs> so uh, if we haven't already um, driven off all of our listeners at this point, uh, I thought we'd go ahead and uh, discuss today's show's topic, which is essentially what are we looking for when we hire uh, a colleague for our department? for our school, whatever the case might be. Uh, we'll have a couple different, pers- three different perspectives tonight. Robert will talk about the clinical um, side of things. Stephen will talk about R1. And I will talk about the small um, private liberal arts colleges uh, and what we look for. Uh, of course, we're not covering every possible uh, sort of job opportunity in academia. Uh, so feel free to put comments below on YouTube and fill in some of the gaps that we might have missed. All right. So, Stephen, why don't we start with you tonight? And let's say you've got a uh, bright-eyed young PhD who's looking for a job at an R1. Hmm. What would you say to this person as to what it is you would be looking for for a hire? Well, so I guess that that hits two levels of questions. First one, you, you phrase it around the idea of a brand new person. Uh, I think you, you do need to separate that in terms of brand new versus been around a little while. But let's focus on the on the brand sure. new side. Uh, and, I, and I say that with the fact that a lot of schools are actually exclusively hiring uh, more advanced person. They don't want to take the risk on a brand new person. But let's say we want to hire a brand new person. Um, you know, the first off, we, we are going to do a pass on that person to see to what extent do they have research? Are they in the process of research, et cetera? Taken very simply, we want to know that we can get somebody tenure uh, or that they at least have a trajectory towards tenure. I mean, obviously we can't guarantee tenure when you're brand new coming out, but we want to say, does it look like this person has a good path towards tenure? Um, That's usually our first cut before we even bring the person in. Uh, So that might be um, reduce our pool of 100 down to, you know, 20 or 15 or something like that. Do we think that just on paper, they look like people who could who could do it? Um, after that, we really focus a lot on um, what do we think about gettability? Uh, so this, again, this is before we've invited people in. So now we start going out to advisors. We start going out to colleagues at other schools that know that person and say, what do we know? What do we hear? Because it costs us money, it costs us time um, to, to invest in bringing somebody in. And if we think, you know what, they're just never gonna want to end up in the middle of nowhere, which is where we are, uh, then we probably don't want to bring them in. We had somebody that we uh, thought about interviewing, I think it was two years ago, who didn't have a license, a driver's license, um, and had never lived anywhere but a major city. And so after talking to her advisor, basically the advisor said, no, she needs to be in a place where she can be in a, on a uh, subway. She has to be. Okay, well, we don't have one of those in this town. Uh, so we're off her list. All right, so then we went down, we narrowed it down to three for a job. We do two to three interviewees per job. Um, that we fly out into, into town. Uh, and that's really, uh, we're looking there on comfort and sort of fit. Because so we've made the assumption that they're going to be competent. I mean, yes, we, they could prove us wrong. You know, they could come in the room and be gibbering idiots. That, that's possible. But what, what I took the advice, I think this was when I was at my first job interview uh, back at Florida State many years ago, the, uh, the, the, the sort of the biggest person there, the most successful faculty member there said, um, 
they didn't believe that an hour, hour and a half presentation really was predictive of job success. They've seen enough situations where somebody would come out there and do a bad job and yet have a successful career or do a great job and do a, have a poor career. So they actually minimized that. They only brought one person out per job and basically you had to do something to piss people off to not bring them in. But um, most places do interview in there and some people get caught up. Well, they, they answered this question this really well and so forth. And some will overanalyze those questions uh, and the answers in job talks. But I think for the most part, people will say is, did they seem competent? If they seemed competent, then we feel we can, we can again, check off that box. And then it comes just back down to fit. You know, do we think this person would be a good fit? Would they add something to our department? Would they work well with the grad students? We're a place that really asks our grad students, do you want this faculty member here? Will they, will you want to work with them? And I know that we have actually, uh, voted against people. We've actually chosen not to make offers to people because the students didn't want them. It happened in my previous jobs as well. Um, and even in grad school, I was able to vote down a, a, a job candidate because they just didn't play well with the students, dismissed us. Um, and so those are sort of the, the, the checks along the way. Mostly this is, this is a, um, I, I guess is a, a positive thing is if you've done the job in grad school, you're in the conversation at the job. You, you, you will be in a lot of job interviews and you will look good on those interviews, assuming that you don't come off like a bumbling idiot. Um, so I think that's a good thing. We're not overweighting that one day or that half day kind of a thing, but you can still screw it up. And I think that's an important thing to, that we don't want to dismiss. There's a lot of situations in which people can go in there and just be dismissive towards faculty. Say the taboo words. Uh, I did that on a job talk once where I actually was mildly dismissive of a theory when the creator of that theory was in the room. Um, that that was my worst interview I've ever had because I, it, it was a bad decision. Um, I didn't think I was that dismissive, but it was a situation where they were under attack. That theory is now dead, um, and it wasn't my doing, but it was that time where they were under so much attack that I think they took any slight to be a attack on that person in that entire department. I think that's where I've run out of steam. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So, but you're saying is that um, even even at the R one, you know, you're 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 receptive to student input. So mm -hmm. you're asking, you know, what's the student feedback? Uh, although the research is is important and being set for tenure, what you feel like is this: if you've done your job in grad school, that should be lined up. And now, what you're really looking for is how is this person going to fit as a potential colleague for life? Yeah, that's the thing. big thing. Is that if if we're going to worry about tenure, yeah. we need to give somebody a job for the next thirty years of their life. Yeah, you want to invest correctly, right? Um, but yeah, that does matter. Now, I will say what ends up happening here, uh, which probably differs a little bit from the other the two other two of you, is teaching evaluations or evaluation of teaching capability is really a small piece of the evaluation. So if there's a thought that this person is going to be terrible in a classroom, that still may not be something that they mark. It's a mark. It's not going to dismiss the person out of hand. If they were the greatest researcher but looked like they would just make the students run away in fear uh, or just you know throw things at them, that's still not necessarily going to take them out of the running entirely. And I think that's a big difference between these different places. Um, that being said, it's always a plus if you have great evaluations. Uh, the ease to which we can transition you into graduate classes, particularly master's level classes, which is where the prestige kinds of stuff is, um, that I think will be a feather in your cap. But the other side is not going to be a huge detriment to your, your case. Fair enough. So yeah, that's not going to kill you, but it would certainly help mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you had that all squared away. You right. came off as a good teacher. No, it makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, uh, Robert, uh, how about you go next to talk about the clinical side? Yeah, it's uh, somewhat similar. Um, you go through and you screen the people. You're not screening so much on research, though. You screen more on practical capability. Uh, what have they done? Do they Can they bring things into the classroom? Particularly if you're uh, at, a, at an R1 school, can they bring stuff into exec ed uh, where the executives won't laugh at them? Uh, when we send these people out in the field, they're not going to say, well, you're just some egghead. What the hell do you know, kid? You know, have you ever been out of the university? Have you ever had a job? Um, you don't want that. I mean, it's the whole reason you hire clinical people is because you want to have some standing either with your donors or 
if you're doing a part-time night MBA program with working adults, you know, they don't want uh, someone coming in and just spouting theory at them. Um, uh, they want to know that you can give them something that they can use Monday morning. So you, you can get a lot of that stuff off the resume, see what they've done. Um, then you start calling around, uh, talk to the colleagues, not so much worrying about gettability as much, uh, worrying more about, okay, yeah, that's all on the resume, but this has been, is their resume built up of a screw up, move up? You know, is this why they've accomplished these things? Because they've, everyone's just tried to promote them out of danger. Um, cause that happens a lot. Uh, why, why do they want to go back into academia? So, cause we generally require, yeah, they have to have a terminal degree. They're going to have a PhD, uh, or if they're business law faculty, they have to have a JD, you know, whatever the terminal degree is. Why are they leaving industry? Why are they leaving? You know, why do, why do you want to do this? Um, because there it's not so much. Can we get them? Because yeah, you can probably get them if they've gone through the trial. And I'm, again, I'm focusing on the new person. New person right. that's decided to go in. They've decided they want to go into academia. They really want to go for the most part. So you can usually get them. But are they going to immediately bail? Um, based on the kind of institution you have, uh, if you treat your clinical faculty like serfs and you're going to give them the thousand person crap class that no one wants to teach, uh, are they going to put up with that? You know, you're not going to get a lot of you know, former execs that are going to go and be willing to be treated like, well, worse than doc students. Because uh, generally, a lot of places treat their doc students kind of crap, you know, especially on teaching assignments. You know, so it's just like, yeah, take this kid. Uh, others are looking more developmental, but a lot of places, you know, it's what wasn't covered by faculty, and these are the slots that are left. Pick something, mm -hmm. uh, which generally aren't the plum positions, you know, the plum teaching gigs. Uh, so we worry about that a lot. And then once they come in, you know, you, you fly them in, then it's more of a, can they pass the travel test? And there is, oh man, the stuff that comes out. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty much, it's almost your job to lose at that point. And generally that's how it'll go. They'll lose it. They'll blow it. They'll blow it huge. They'll come in and just be arrogant asses uh, and immediately start dis <laughs> dismissing research in academia. So that can be a problem. Or they'll come in the other way. They're tenure failures that figure out this is a way that they can get back in because nobody cares about this crap. And she's like, no, we don't want a tenure wannabe, you know, thinking that they can transition over. Uh, one, most schools won't allow that. You know, you start one, you stay, you're, the, you're tenure track and you can't come over the fence this way or you're not tenure track, you can't go over the fence that way. Um, so that can be a problem. You know, you get the... Or I've seen a couple where you get the starry-eyed academics that are like, mm, you know, it's just like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, this isn't going to fly. No one will tolerate that crap. You know, you got to get to the point, cut to the chase. While at the same time being very respect, recept, both respectful and receptive of what research faculty do. You know, uh, you know can you play well with, with standard academics? And for a lot of people, they can't. Uh, yeah, in my time, in the nine years I spent at, at Penn State as a clinical faculty member, half the people we had in who were clinicals were horrid. Uh, couldn't play well with others. Some we fired. Uh, others quit. Uh, uh, they just did not gel well. Um, others were fantastic. One of the best ones we ever had was a full professor with tenure who decided that she didn't want to do that part anymore, right? It was senior, uh, was one of the, the best clinical colleagues I think I ever had. I mean, she was fantastic and just had a love of teaching, didn't want to serve on committees anymore, didn't want to do any of her research anymore, just wasn't interested, just wanted to do the other bits. It was, you know, it was sort of a retiree kind of a job. In that yeah, just, I want to do this for like you know, three, five years, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of my career. Um, and, and that was fantastic. That was great. Um, but yeah, you see the whole gamut in clinicals can be wow. Uh, because you can't look at them as adjuncts. If you look at them as adjuncts, the whole system fails. You have to look at them the way medical schools do. You have your research faculty and then you have your practical faculty and they both need to coexist and understand what the other one does and leave them the hell alone to do what the other one does. Uh, that seems to be the way it, it works best. But pretty much by the time you get the site visit, 
it's your job to lose. Uh, so it's not quite, it, I think it's, and I've seen that quite a few places now. It, it plays out a little differently than the tenure track job. Uh, when I, I've seen people, you know, because uh, I've been on search committees for that too. And this isn't just in the business school. Uh, I've been on a number of search committees over in engineering, uh, which also tends to have your more practical faculty and your more research faculty. And it's the same way there. You know, can, these are people coming out who have been engineers, who know how the engineering world works. Right. Uh, they aren't, they aren't the theorists, but they have appreciation of all that. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah. And oh, God, do not give a paper. Um, when they come in, you always have a talk. When you give your talk, don't do a research talk. So because if you're the hot, you know, if you're a blazing hot researcher, you should be getting the damn research job. <laughs> uh, and if you are going to give a paper, it better be a practical paper. You know, something you put in a practical journal. You know, or in our place, if you came in and you had an HBR piece, you know, that's what I'd like to see. You know, some actual, you know, can you translate research into practice? You know, that would be an interesting talk. Don't give a research paper because we don't give a crap. Um, which I learned six hours before my first job talk. Uh, came in and they said, I had dinner the night before because a lot of times you'll do this. Came in and they said, and they asked me, what are you going to do for your job talk? And I was going to give a paper. And they went, are you out of your mind? <laughs> Ate up the rest of the night and redid my whole talk. Well, got the job. Um, but yeah, a horrible, horrible idea. But that's what I thought because that's, you know, as a doc student, that's what you see. Unless you see someone do a clinical talk, you see a research talk, you come in and you do this and you're prepared and you get your dissertation, especially if it's like your first gig after you finish grad school. That's what you think you're supposed to do. And oh, oh no, <laughs> do not do that. And don't play the flute. So <laughs> apparently I didn't see this, but the, some of my colleagues have told me that uh, one of the people up against me, which, which made it really easy for me to get the job, I guess, came in and played the damn flute. Don't play the flute. Unless you're up for a clinical music job to show how awesome you are at the flute. <laughs> what the hell? Who plays the flute when you're flying for a business school job? Yeah. Don't be weird. Because uh, people really are. It's the travel test matters. These are potential colleagues for life. Add on the other level, which I think it's it plays for each of these jobs as well. We've talked about, I think, in a previous talk, uh, a previous uh, um, show, but I think also matters specifically here is it's the faculty matter, the students matter, mm -hmm. but the staff also matters. Oh, um, hell. oh and yes. so we, we've had examples, uh, and, and I can think of this one with you, Robert, of, of a person who had the job until was basically dismissive towards all of the female staff members um, mm -hmm. and lost the job. I mean, on, on that piece alone. Yeah. So, you know, you have to be careful. Great agnostic tool because most faculty blow off staff. So you can get a little, because, you know, supposedly on an interview, you're on your best behavior. Uh, that's why students are great, too, because sometimes faculty people are really dismissive of the students, like they're just scum. Why am I even bothering? And it gives you kind of insight of, do you really want to be with these people potentially 30 years? Or we got a faculty member in my department now who's been here 50 years. Wow. So it's just like. Uh, you're a good colleague. You're going to be around him. <laughs> wow. Three. Yeah. He's not emeritus. He's still he's still regular line faculty. I like what I do, but my God, I do not want to do it for 50 years. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I do. I like what I do, but 50 years. Wow. Yeah. Well, you'll see when retirement changes to 75, you might be uh, whistling a slightly different tune. Yeah, well, maybe. Well, I may not be wanting to do it. I just might be doing it. <laughs> For sure. So, yeah, it's just be a decent human being. And the interview never ends. Yeah. Why that lie? <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. Well, no, but it sounds like you brought some good points about the um, clinical specific aspect in terms of what type of person is the type of person should be going after a clinical position. It's a different beast than an R1 or another type of position. Um and that practical aspect is really the focus there. Um, now, what's interesting uh, with, with the types of institutions that I've, I've taught at in terms of being a small liberal arts college, I should probably preface this with saying that I'm not talking about um, sort of the, the high prestige 
liberal arts colleges, like, you know, your Swarthmore's, your Williams, those kinds of things, because they're going to be looking for different things than I'm going to be talking about. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about sort of your smaller liberal arts schools, private schools, residential schools that uh, really put teaching first. And just because you're invited to the interview does not mean that's your job to lose. Because uh, we could be very well just making a tough decision between three really good candidates. So, so there's no guarantee just because you've called out that you've been called out that, you know, you're, you've got the job. Um, so what we're looking for first and foremost is how well do you interact with students and how well do you teach? You will be giving a teaching lecture. You will be giving a teaching demonstration. And uh, we will be talking to the students after your teaching demonstration. And we will be asking students straightforward questions about did they like the style of the lecture or the style of the presentation? Did they uh, understand? Did they follow the lesson? Uh, did it make sense to them? Uh, would they like to be sort of in a class with this type of person? You know, we're, we're uh, going to be asking questions about that first and foremost. The research is important, but the teaching is more important. Uh, you'll have lunch with students, likely. We'll ask about that, too. We'll ask the students straight up. How, how is this candidate as you were having lunch with them? You know, what are the things you liked? What are the things that you disliked? And the students will be brutally honest. They will not... They will not pull punches, and they will compare you to the other candidates that we have brought onto campus, straight up to our face. They will say, we like Dr. So-and-so better than Dr. Such-and-such -such because. And so you cannot, if you're coming for a position like, like where I teach, you're, you're, you're obviously interested primarily in teaching to begin with. So if you come off and dismissive to the students at all, you've just shot yourself in the foot. There's no way you're walking away with the job. All right. Um, so that's first and foremost. And then with your research talk, uh, you, and you'll give a research talk. We want to see, you know, one, you know, do you do you know what you're talking about when it comes to your field? You probably do. But can you then take that and make it understandable to the undergraduates and the faculty who are not in or will be in your department? And how do they feel about that talk? So I'll ask the students, what did you learn? And if they look at me and say, uh, nothing, it's not a good sign. <laughs> it's happened before. <laughs> uh, or if they said, you know, that'd be cool if such and such came here and I could work with him or her in, in their lab, that's a good sign. Right? Now, that's a piece that, sign. that you added on there, you guys actually have people from other departments sitting in on your talks and your yes. case? Okay. Yes. Can you oh, talk absolutely. a little about that? Yeah, sure. Because we're, uh, you know, small schools. Uh, you might have let's say a three person department and maybe you're replacing somebody who's retiring. Well, that person's not going to be on the committee. So we're not going to have a two person committee. Uh, and so, yeah, absolutely. When I, when I, uh, when I was hired, um, person on my committee was from the creative writing it was the outside person. And did, did so you creatively write any physics for him? No, no, not at all. Um, well, I had a very good conversation with them that obviously turned out okay. Um, uh, because I was hired but yeah, you have to be prepared to talk to your, talk to uh, the person who's from outside of your um, department about your research, about what you do, and they need to be able to understand it. In some level, we had a, a, a candidate at one point in time, um, from what I understand, at a previous institution who uh, basically had told the provost that they weren't going to talk to them about their research because you wouldn't understand it. Nice. <laughs> yep, that's done. Done. Because that is not the level of collegiality we need at a small school. <laughs> right? It's not going to happen. So, yeah, you absolutely. And so your research needs to be understandable. Plus, you might be, let's say, interviewing at a physics department, but the two physicists that maybe you're on your own committee may not be in your subfield. So they may not be familiar with all the details of that. So, again... You don't want to go too deep in jargon and technicality in your field. You want to make sure that people understand what you do. What I've done in the past, because my field of expertise is nonlinear dynamics, which is not very common in physics departments, especially at small schools, I would give a talk more like, what is nonlinear dynamics? All right? And then part of that talk would be, this is what I do. So I'd give like a very uh, overview, like a survey, 
And then, you know, one of my specific examples in my survey would be, okay, well, some people do this particular thing in this field. It's got to be understandable by the students and faculty from outside the department. And those are the kind of things we're looking for. How good of a communicator are you? Because it's teaching first, then it's research, and then it's service in that order. And uh, if you don't know that going in, and there have been candidates who didn't, it will be clear. They can write a good good cover letter and they can have a good um, you know, teaching statement, all that stuff, and then show up um, just not working with the students well or working with the other faculty well. Yeah, just uh, dividing up the, the three-part mission for each of us, it's all in a completely different order, mm -hmm. where for mine, it's, it's service teaching research. Right. And Stevens, it's research, research, research. Uh, we have some <laughs> other stuff in there. Now, I've been at places where it was, for, at one point in time in the past, it was teaching service research. Okay. Um, but most places, I think, or many places I'm familiar with have moved away from it. That's teaching research service. Yeah. Uh, but like I said, the key with the small liberal arts schools is, is your ability to communicate with people who are not in your field, especially with the students. What's nice is there's a, co a common theme across all of us here. You know, obviously we have the specifics. So, you know, yours is to communicate to um, the students particularly. How do I communicate, or, or broadly, how do I communicate what I think and doing across these areas? Roberts is how do I communicate to um, the constituents, in this case could be executives or, or something similar, uh, as well as students. And in my case, it might be communicate our research ideas to researchers. But I think the more important part that, that's theming across all of this is don't be a jerk. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you come off bad yeah. in any of these spots, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, there are cases where you will hear of a superstar will get through. Obviously, they can be a complete jerk and get through. But that's more of the exception than, than the rule, as it were. Um, people, again, if you're going to commit to a job where you're going to have you know, a three-year contract or a tenure or any of those kinds of things where you have a while with that person, you're not going to want to jerk. You're not going to want to put up with that. So coming on, not just it being on your best behavior, but not being a jerk. Don't act the way that, you know, this, this is particularly info for grad students, advice for grad students, is you might not have been treated the greatest by your advisor, uh, don't take that out or, or signal that that's what you plan on doing when you take the new job. Because that was something you could get away with 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Those are the people who were probably the worst were the ones who have been in that job for 30, 40, 50 years. Today, you, you're just not going to make it through being a jerk. It just, it just won't work. No one wants to tolerate that crap. Right. There's too many people out there. Yeah, you don't have to tolerate that. It's research right. record ever, but... I can find someone who's almost as good, who isn't an ass. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We get 100 applications for every job that we give, that we post. I mean, I don't. I, we can go to number three and be okay, you know? Yeah, and I know in some fields, I've heard in mathematics, it's just insane. You'll get 500 or 1,000 applicants per job. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, some fields are just, <laughs> you know, philosophy, English, a lot of these are super saturated with PhDs all over the place and not a lot of jobs. Right. So you've got to be particularly careful that you pass the good colleague test. Because uh, with that many applicants, people are going to really start to look the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, one thing I didn't bring up, and we might want to do this sometime, talk about uh, interviewing when you're a little bit more senior. Um, but my last time on the market here, I had one set of interviews where I met with the provost and six deans, and that was it. Uh, didn't really meet with faculty because it wasn't that kind of a gig, They've, even though I would have been embedded in a department. Um, or in my current gig here, uh, I met with a couple of the high net worth donors, um, the, the board of visitors. I had a, a meeting with all of them. Uh, so you, uh, industry people, uh, the head of the research part, uh, part here had a had a veto power over the hire, uh, huh. so while she could pick the person she wanted, she d did essentially because of the way the document was written uh, by the guy who endowed it, uh, had veto power and just said no, don't think so, because um, a significant portion of my job is is now with her. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm on I'm a member of her board of directors, so in essence, she had some control over hiring someone who's almost their boss now uh, as much as any board of directors can tell a CEO what to do. Um, 
So it's kind of weird. Uh, sometime I think maybe we should do that in a later episode, especially since I know what Stephen was talking about at the beginning, um, that uh, the market for a senior assistant uh, and the market, the market for associates kind of sucks. But senior assistants and uh, for full, um, the market there is just a completely different market and a very different way of interviewing. And a lot of it is not the quality of a CV you send, send into some random, you know, posting. It's who you called and who you know. And some of these jobs are never even announced. Mm-hmm. You know, you, certain schools will just cherry pick people. Uh, so that's yeah. a good follow up for us. Yeah, I've seen uh, a, a trend, and I don't know if it's because I've been paying attention as I've gotten further along in my career, or if it, and it's always, or it's always been this case, or if it actually is a trend where more options for uh, associate or something along the lines of um, will hire at a sort of a reason of, or how do I want to say it? Will hire at a more advanced rank if the candidate is appropriate. Mm-hmm. For that consideration uh and so i have seen some of that now most of that though has been at uh bigger universities not so much at the smaller schools uh and usually when i see a strength i'm sorry a lot of times it's a money constraint to kind of for yeah yep a mid yep. person yep absolutely uh and i should also like uh, st- uh also tell folks that are listening to us and i'm sure they already know this but just in case this is all based on our experiences right well, uh <laughs> yeah, of course. And so, you know, you might be just in this area. I did zero research. Right, right. You might be listening at, at here in, in, in a position where you're in a hiring committee right now saying, well, that's not at all what we're looking for. We teach at a school just like Stevens or Chris's or whatever. Well, that could be, right? This is just sort of what we have noticed in our careers as we serve on hiring committees, uh, what things that, you know, we personally looked for or have noticed other colleagues looking for. And we've been at multiple universities each ourselves as well. I know that's. There's a crazy person in the background too. Don't worry. Yeah, it's my wife. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Robert. <laughs> so anyway. Okay. Then. Uh, yeah, I think with that, it's probably time just to go ahead and wrap the show up. Uh, so if you have uh, anything you'd like to share with us, please, please um, t- follow us on Twitter at Professor's Life or post on the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. And until then, everybody, get back to writing.